Yeah. All good, Sean. How you doing? How's everything in Ireland? Ah, good, man. We just all ended our lockdown on Monday, so we've been locked down for three months, and it's like taking its toll on people. You know, we're like, like you just said, we forget what day it was. You know. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm glad it's over. I'm glad like we're well. I hope it's over, but I'm glad we're actually, you know, out of lockdown, able to travel to see my parents, to see my family. I don't have to go anywhere. So I don't know. What's it like where you are? Are you in New York or in Miami? I'm in Miami, and actually we're going backwards. So that's what I was gonna tell you. Just be careful because I guess Florida was one of the states that like was more flexible with the opening and all that. And uh, the numbers are going, like, we're going in reverse, basically. So, um, so it's not looking good. Like, they closed the beaches for, you know, the Independence Day coming up, and the bars are closed again, which is a problem. Yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Shit, yeah. I've heard, like, well, Beijing is locked down again, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, fuck it. We just got to, I don't know what to do, man. Yeah, we just can't stay locked down forever, though, can we? Got it. Exactly, man. Just be careful with the Guinness and the, and the pubs and all that, right? Yeah, I actually stopped. I gave up alcohol six years ago. Seven yeah, years ago. yeah. I was gonna ask you about that, right? So, Sean, before I, I butcher your last name for like for an extended yeah. period of time, how do you say your last name? Uh, Sean O'Corcron. Okay. Yeah, Perfect. O'Corcron. Yeah, Thank it's you. like it's the Irish version of my name. The English version is Sean Corcoran, but I don't use that. I think there's actually some like towns in uh, in America called Corcoran. I think there's yeah. one in California. Um, but I don't, I use my Irish name, so. Perfect, man. Perfect. Yeah, well, listen, thank yeah. you for joining us. Thank you. And apologies in advance if I butcher some of your Gaelic words and, and all that, man. You no know. worries at all. Like, I'll ju I'm just glad people are actually attempting to say them, you know, to, to use Gaelic because it is a dying language. Absolutely, so, Sean. I'm so, yeah. It. Look, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you. Karma of Youth came out April. What an album, yeah. John! I gotta tell oh, you, what, you. What, what a piece of what a piece of art, you know, you know, critically acclaimed by Hot Press, record of the day, and and I can I, and I can see why it is a spectacular piece of work, and everyone needs to hear it, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, man. No uh, worries, dude. Yeah, it's great to hear because like during lockdown, it's I, I didn't think lockdown would affect me as much as it did, or any you know, any of my friends. Uh, you know, being an artist, I was thinking. I got lots of time now to create and I've got lots of time to, you know, do whatever I want, but, um, yeah. didn't really work out that way. It felt like creativity dried up and it felt like really? without human contact, it felt like things just became lost their meaning. That's what happened, you know, and uh, I found it quite hard. Like, so it's great to be able to talk to you. <laughs> it's great to be able to do interviews on zoom. It's great to be able to hear feedback on the album because it was like, I don't know. It's things lost their meaning. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I don't yeah, know absolutely. You guys there, but it, without it's a very interesting social experiment. Without prolonged, you know, absence of human contact, things yeah. you love start to lose their meaning. It was so strange. Like good things would happen during the the, the lockdown to me. Um, even you know something like getting a nice you know a financial payment or you know hearing good news or someone loves a record or anything you know there was there's lots of good news and it started to lose its effect that was one of the most bizarre things that happened to me um some of my friends experienced that too um where just things started to kind of lose their meaning which is frightening in a way we've yeah. never had that before and I think, well, probably a hundred years ago in the human experience where you just kind of, you're so isolated that, uh, you know, it's a strange effect, but I, I'm definitely so, um, I know as my name is outsider, I'm definitely a lot more appreciative now of the value of human contact. Um, um, so, yeah, I suppose it's just great to hear people have been getting in touch with me again about the album and the fact that I'm actually able to move about Ireland for some reason, I can't explain it. It must be psychological. It just means more now. I, for a while, I was kind of going into a void, man, to be honest, where I was really? like, what? Does anything mean anything? I'm like, you know, so it did kind of hit me hard, that uh, the lockdown. And I didn't realize it, but I did slip into this kind of void. So maybe yeah. I'm predisposed to that or something. I don't know. But uh, yeah, no, it's been hard. hard. So, 
that's a long answer for thank you very much for complimenting my album and listening to it, you know, so. No, it's all good. No, it's all good, but you're right. You know, I mean, we, we talk to all sorts of artists, whether they're, you know, John Oates of Hall & Oates or, you know, Medium, and everyone's having a different experience, but a lot of them, a lot of people, myself included, have dark days and struggles. It's It's been rough, man. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Some people have been like, well, I was thought, one of my friends was just, not to be kind of going on about this too much, but he was like telling me he was going great, but then I met him and we just talked one-on-one. Yeah, uh, kind of image, you know. I thought I was losing my mind there for a while. So you know, I think we can. We're all in different phases. Um, to me, it looks like the world is going through dab da. So some are in denial about it, and others are angry. Yeah. Uh, then, like I don't know, it's bargaining. That's probably more abstract. Others then are in at depression. But we're we're all kind of reacting to this um, virus in such a it's definitely affecting all of our emotions. You know, there's some, it's a tense time around the world now as well. You know, even sure politically, is. it's so tense. Not saying that, that that political action doesn't need to happen, but it sparked it. You know, this it got sparked. People's anger got sparked, you know. People's, yeah. um, you know, so the reactions have been so potent. Um, it's very interesting, really interesting. It sure has. It sure has, Sean. Um, yeah, absolutely. So you you grew up in uh, County Tipperary, Ireland, right? A province of Munster? Yeah, yeah. Jesus, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I grew cool. up in County Tipperary, yeah. See, so like, that's, for people that don't know, that's kind of southwest of Dublin, right? Yeah, like, close exactly. To Limerick. Exactly, yeah, that's exactly it, yeah. Exactly. Cool. Actually, Limerick's a city um, nearby. Mm-hmm. Um you want me to talk a bit about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, like, yeah talk actually, about it growing up and all that stuff there. Yeah, growing up, I... I can't say I loved it. Small town in, you know, kind of very rural uh, setting. Um, about 10,000 people in the town. Then the nearest city is 25 minutes. It's Limerick. Um, I felt that there wasn't a lot going on culturally. You know, um, there wasn't a lot of options musically. Um, there wasn't a lot of interest. You know, the local scene would have been just bands, like tribute bands, playing cover sounds there would have been no real original scene even though the cranberries were from limerick like that was oh, a really? rare okay. occurrence. yeah the, the cranberries are a limerick band interesting that was like a yeah that was like a rare occurrence around that time in the 80s where you two kind of uh, we always had artists still coming out of ireland but just where i was it didn't feel very um culturally kind of active uh, musically active so uh i wasn't i don't know i didn't really enjoy growing up there it wasn't for me uh, I found it a tough place to grow up. I still feel like the south of Ireland is really badly affected by the famine. Transgenerational, I think. You know, I think it's transgenerational, um, I don't know, trauma, I suppose. Yeah. Um, because Ireland had that famine and colonization by England. And mainly the south was really badly affected by all that. And I can still see the effects. And like, I didn't realize that when I was growing up. Now that I'm older and I study a bit more, I go, wow, this is what happened. You know, because where I live now is a beautiful place and it's cultural and the people here seem to have like transgenerational joy or something, you know, but uh, it's it's like where I come from, there was just a lot of, it feels like there's a lot of dark, hidden sadness. Um, interesting, interesting. Yeah. But but was your family artistic, Sean? Like like uh, where does the art and the music you know come from? I don't think they. I think they might be, um, but I don't think they ever got an opportunity to express that. If they were, you know, it, I think in where they grew up or where they, that place where I grew up, I don't think it would have had any. There wouldn't have been anywhere for them to express them, or there wouldn't have been a, a medium for it or uh, a scene for it there. So. Right. Even if they are, maybe I think my father could be poetic, but no, they don't play musical instruments. Um, they seem, I, as they get older and as I become a bit more spiritual, I see a spiritual side to them that, that maybe they're not even aware of my family. Mm-hmm. you know. And I do see a creative and spiritual side. As my mother's got older, she's gotten into art and painting, you know. Um, but it was never something that would have been... I encouraged for them, you know, it was kind of like they grew up um, quite poor. So it would have been a case of you just work, you know. Yeah. yeah so they would have came from quite, you know, um, very simple backgrounds, rural farming backgrounds, um, quite hardworking. And um, 
that's you know I don't, I don't think maybe maybe you know I, it could be in them so I can't answer that question fully to say uh, no they're not creative <laughs> right right, right uh, I don't know right. where it came from for me um, but uh, where do you find it like do, do you have a moment where you were like first memory where yeah. you were like man, man this Bruce Springsteen album it's moving my soul or something like yeah like, yeah moving. that's yeah definitely that there was kind of that watershed moment for me I felt a bit lost growing up you know I didn't really feel like I fit in at all like my interests, I, I, you know, I liked poetry. I liked the arts. Um, I was even ashamed, actually. I was kind of hiding that I played an instrument when I started. So different from America, man. It's like, I used to dream about living in America because it's just not something that was, even the style of music I liked would have been very contrary to the culture of where I came from, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Dublin's a different scene, you know. Dublin's a completely different place to where I grew up. Um, so, yeah, I, I just kind of, I remember feeling lost or sad or, you know, even depressed, you know, in my teens and just hearing music, like, I think it was the Stone Roses and the Joy Division. I heard those bands. I also loved Springsteen, like my auntie who's dead now, she died of cancer. Uh, I don't know how long ago now, Jesus, 10 years ago, but uh, she used to play records of Bruce Springsteen. When I was like, mm -hmm. oh, I could be four or five, and she'd just get us dancing around her house. And that's a great memory, you know, just like blaring, uh, nice blaring records. So I think that kicked off Springsteen in me, definitely. Um, and she used to play Rod Stewart, too, who I have an affinity for. I like Rod Stewart. I know it's not the coolest thing to say, but I do like him. Uh, no, I like, cool. I like the face. Cool. Yeah, I like the faces, too. But she just used to play really cool 80s music. And moving on from that, then... It was the Stone Roses and hearing the bass lines in the Joy Division, um, that just kicked, yeah, that kind of ignited my soul. So I bought a bass guitar, hmm. I think it was 15. Or so I got, to, I had someone I knew to pick up a bass guitar for me. And I started playing the bass. And that's yeah. all I wanted to do, play the bass. And I was writing lyrics. So I just wanted to be like a co-writer. I didn't have any confidence in myself. I wanted to be a bass player, backing vocalist maybe co-write, maybe help out a bit. I, I didn't have the confidence to be like a front man or anything. And uh, that kind of went on for me. So I played in bands and I didn't really, I was never really satisfied with the music we were making. So then I decided, okay, I'll learn the guitar. I think it was around 23, 24. And eventually in the, in the bands I was in, I started to write everything. Because, you know, the work wasn't getting done, the guitar lines weren't being completed, and I wanted to do it, so I'd write the bass, the guitar, the keyboards, and the lyrics, and then finally I wrote all the melodies too, so I was, by the time I got to about 28, I was writing everything, you know, and yeah. uh, then I just found that that, yeah, I, I developed slowly but surely, and I still didn't have the confidence to sing my first record, I think it was like, I think it was 29 when I sang on my first song. Um, yeah, because like when I was growing up playing in bands, I was so desperate to be in band when I was like 16. I would play with all these older guys and they were assholes and they pretty much were like, you can't sing and you can't play and just like put me down all the time. That kind of had an effect on me for a long time. Yeah, yeah, sure. For about, yeah, for about 10 years. So this is like outsiders, just me doing my thing after a long time. So I sometimes look at like Kirk Cobain and I'm like, Jesus, uh, he's 27 and he had all these songs, you know, these amazing songs. Um, but I suppose I hadn't even sang on one song. But it, by the time I was 27, I hadn't even sang. Isn't that I amazing, Sean? You're, you're, you're a really spiritual guy, but like the concept yeah. of like some people kind of like dragging you down because of their own light being, you know. Uh, yeah, dim, yeah, if people dim feel like... Yeah, that's a really great, what you said there is really spot on. Like, it's great insight what you say, because if, if people feel like your light is bright, some people, I'm not saying everyone. Right, saying right, right. People, but they're out they're there, yeah. That sure. light, they need to dim that light, yeah. They need yeah. To, yeah, so. That's well, so John, well, your aunt was super cool then. Your aunt, uh, you know, is she, is she still alive, your aunt? No, she's dead. Uh, oh, sorry to hear that. 56 cancer, yeah. Mm, um, yeah, yeah wow. she was super cool. Yeah, she was actually. Um, Definitely. Yeah, cool. it's, it's like that's a memory that I only really because of actually interviews like this. I I hadn't accessed that memory for a long time, um, and you're you're the second person I think I've spoke to about this where I just it just came back to me. I appreciate yeah. it. That's a beautiful, beautiful memory, actually. You know, yeah. dancing to Bruce Springsteen to Rod Stewart, like that's the things that make life worth living, man.
Yeah, it is because so much, I don't know, has happened and she died. And I suppose my older brother and I, you know, we went our separate ways. Life happens. And mm -hmm. that's just this memory. It's actually amazing memory. It's one of those memories you never forget. That Because people would ask me, I never really was obsessed with Springsteen in my teens. Um, and I have this Springsteen in me. And it's like, people would always ask, well, where is that coming from? And I think I got that injected right into my core at like five yeah. years old in That's the best awesome. possible way. So I think it's just, it's always going to, you know, live in me, you know. Um, that was just part of my development. Probably sure. it was just a building block of my soul nearly. And I had forgotten that because, you know, you go and explore other bands, more alternative stuff. And, you know, uh, I went through my darker stuff and... yeah. Springsteen's just there for me, so it's that's it's totally it's attached to that memory. It really have you had a chance to see him live? No, I haven't actually. You know, you know, just make sure you take your sneakers and the whole thing, because he can go on for four hours. Yeah, it's man, like <laughs> uh, it's amazing. I actually went to see. Uh, you just remind me of the Cure. Yeah, and I was waiting a long time to see them. We actually, I was in a band and we played at the same festival, and I got to see it them play and people were complaining that they play for three hours and i was just i thought it was all spectacular non-stop oh sure uh, i just loved every minute of it i don't know why you could complain that they played for that long because it was just everything was perfect it was just a band you know sometimes you can sometimes i feel like a band or maybe past it i've seen the stones before and i was like i don't know if they should be doing this anymore right but, um, the cure was just like they've got everything perfect this is like a band still in love with what they do and sure. uh, it was just it was so it sounded better than the record and that's that rarely yeah. happens it actually right. sounded but i just couldn't believe it sounded better than the record it was like this you were in this dream world uh for three hours and that's what it felt like to me and you know all credit to robert smith you know he's just nailed it one of the greats one of the greats absolutely so before we get to your music real quick, you mentioned some, you know, watching The Cure at a festival. Mm -hmm. What are some of the gigs, uh, Sean, that, um, that you've performed, the festivals that, that uh, maybe moments that you've pinched yourself and you're like, oh my God, like, look at this okay. moment where I am with, you know, 10,000 people and they're screaming my songs or look at the bill that I'm headlining with, like moments like that. Yeah, one of them was, in a, was when The National actually headlined a show. And I think Warpaint were on the same stage. It was just, uh, it wasn't a huge festival. It was in Mannheim in Germany, which made it even more special. But it was only just like 5,000 attending. But the lineup was just incredible. And I don't know how. 5,000 well, people just for like, the National Warpaint. Wow. And you? Yeah, it was, well, it was the National were there, Warpaint. Hosey was there. He was up and coming. Um, uh, EMA was there from California. Who else? Um, can't think of it. St. Vincent was there. Um, now they were like all back to back. Um, there was more there though, incredible bands. Hell of a lineup. Um, sorry? Hell of a lineup. Fantastic. Yeah, hell, it was a hell of a lineup. 5,000 people, huh? Yeah, for just that small festival <laughs> and the national headline. Name. And uh, I, that was one of my best experiences just being on the same stage as all those bands because we opened that stage. And um, it was just like, I don't know, it was because it was so small, because the backstage was so small, because it was such an intimate event, you know, again, to meet all these people staying in the same hotel, um, it was just, that was a really cool moment, a really cool Very moment. Cool. The crowd were really cool as well, because sometimes, you know, you can play, the crowd just, sometimes there's an, a shared energy in, in, you know, sometimes you go to festivals like 30,000 people and you play to an audience and you don't really give a fuck. <laughs> Like, you know, you kind of have to win them over sometimes or sometimes they're just waiting for the next band if they don't know your stuff or, you know, there can be a million different ways it goes down. But that was very special because the crowd were just like, it seemed to be a small lineup of, you know, really top quality music and a small amount of people attending it. And they were all just there to just, you know, vibe and they were just really into the music and it was just a special moment. They're rare, but I've had a couple of those. So that's, that comes to mind immediately. Um, and you'll have a, you have a lot more and you, and you'll have the headlining, you know, once all this is over, you'll be yeah. there. At that would the top. be great. Yeah. That would be yeah, that, great. Yeah. That's where you're headed, man. With, with this fantastic albums, really anthemic stuff. So that's, yeah. that's where we're going, Sean. This is just a temporary pause. 
Yeah, yeah, big time, man. Yeah, well, that's the that's the that's the goal. That's the dream. It's like I love making that anthemic music that could fill a stadium, you know, or it could headline a festival. Okay. Croke uh, Park, you're, you're gonna headline Croke Park. I'm calling it, man. Yeah, and when you do, I, and when you do, I'm taking an Aer Lingus and we're doing a show from Coke to celebrate that we talked about this. That's I, what's happening. I, that would be awesome. Have you ever been? I did go to Croker once uh, to see. I saw you two there in 2000. Oh, man. Yeah, I see the post behind you. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I love a lot of Irish music. But yeah, great. I, I think it's hilarious that the stadium is like right next in a, like to a residential neighborhood, basically. Yeah, so yeah, it's like yeah. You walk by people's cars and like the stadium's right there. They stopped the concerts for a long time. The residents, they mm -hmm. stopped it for a long time. They don't seem to mind you too, but like apparently like they shut down. Garrett Brooks, it sold out a lot and the residents just stopped it. And there's this big, I don't know. No, I, there was this big like... There was a lot of like trouble and stuff in the media about it, but yeah, yeah, they seem to be okay again. Seem to be cool again, but yeah, it's in a, it's just in the middle of this residential area. But that's Ireland. It's like some mad things happen in the planning of. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, um, but playing croaker is just it's mind blowing. Perfect. Mind -blowing. Yeah, there's you two are one of those few bands that could do that, you know. Yeah. As well, you know, yeah. um, because like we've got a small population, so it's hard to. If you're getting eight, filling a stadium with eighty thousand people in Ireland, like that's a sure, it's a big hell deal. Of an achievement, yeah, it's a it's a hell of an achievement because like you probably have got like maybe only a million people that are really, maybe less like really hardcore music fans. Probably like right. half half a million people in, in the whole country. But uh, you know, you've got those bands that they've been they've released so much quality music for so long that they just unite everyone. Their household names, absolutely. Um, yeah. So let me ask you about one of like your most popular singles of Karma of Youth. Um, mm. And please, I'm going to butcher this. Mio Mormara, right? Oh, yeah. Mio Mormara. Yeah. 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 It's a song you that. Perfect. You got it right. You got that perfect, man. Really? Yeah, you got <laughs> okay. that perfect. You're too kind. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> uh, but like, what a song. Like, inspiring. I mean, biblical references like Noah and the Whale. You know, I've heard people on the highways, like when they're driving at night by themselves, get inspired by it. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is it is a tune, a fantastic tune. So I want to ask you a little bit about this song and about this story, right? I, I read somewhere that uh, you got inspired partly by um by your relationship with a kid who who was going through some stuff and so, yeah. and something like. Why don't you tell us about that? I was going through a really bad time because um, I had just broken up in a relationship. I was actually I gave up alcohol at that time because I was actually drinking. So right. I was living in Limerick, that city, and uh, I was going out with, I was in a relationship with a, uh, a long-term relationship, and I was in a band as well for like, I think it was like four years, but I just started to, I don't know, I was very unhappy. There was a lot more going on, you know, obviously, right. ch childhood stuff maybe, and uh, I just started to drink to help me write the songs, but I felt a lot of pressure on me because I was writing all the music, and playing all the instruments and the rest of the band members, I don't know if they were as into it. Let's just put it this way. None of them play music anymore. So that's a telltale sign. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that all kind of ended probably like I, I ended it really um, in a, in a roundabout way. We came, you know, we came back from a tour and that was, it, it was kind of, we all knew it was kind of over. Um, but yeah, so I was, after it all ended, I felt like there was a big, I was like wondering who the hell I was because right. you know, after a relationship breaking up um, band breaking up, you kind of lose your friends in that process too. Um, you need a bit of time apart anyway. And um, with the alcohol, then reliance on that to write songs, it just didn't really know what I was doing or where my life was going. I definitely made, I don't know if I'd made the right choices or maybe uh, from a spiritual point of view, I was just like on your journey. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe that, that's what needed to happen. So I left that city kind of just broken hearted and broken in many ways. Uh, but I knew I just needed to leave and go somewhere. So I moved to this city beside the ocean, actually. I've got tattooed just to remind me about. But uh, there's this uh, salt hill. So I started working with this kid who had, because um, I teach as well. So I started to teach this kid who had uh, Down syndrome. And what do you that, teach? Uh, I just, no, I don't teach music. It just says, uh, like, I think you call it a 
grade school. Okay, know. sure, sure, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I, I was teaching at that time, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd given up music, actually, at that time. I was just too hurt by it. I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm moving on with my life, you know, and um, tried to give it up. And, uh, yeah, I was just working with this kid, and I remember going in so sad every day to – to this you know to this job and I was like I felt like my life is meaningless and I was broken hearted and you know I could even felt like crying in there but I would just go and work with this kid and he was just like so goddamn happy and just so happy to see me that amazing you yeah see so, so like yeah I was watching something the other day why does someone like you know like Robin Williams who everybody in the everybody in the world loved right he made everyone laugh or someone like anthony bourdain right like yeah. people that are universally beloved and they're in such pain inside right and they have everything and then someone like like this boy so i'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt i just wanted to throw that in there go no, ahead you're, no yeah. no it's great what you're saying it's great insight you totally get it. like this boy then who has every, like challenges i can't even imagine you know i can't even imagine them still can't like talk about Getting maybe I feel like I didn't get the opportunities. Like shut the fuck up is is what I say to myself. You know, oh maybe you grew up and it was hard, or you didn't have some whatever. Nobody got you, or nobody understood you. You're like man, you fucking. Uh, it just put me in my place, you know, because like this kid is just amazing. Probably yeah. never ha will have the opportunity to. You know, he was like, he was still learning how to speak. He was eight and still learning. You know, it was a huge success when we, the first time he wrote his name. Like, I was really proud of that moment. That's how, you know, that's how challenging life was. You know, it took him yeah. about six months to write his own name. And uh, it just had this effect on me where it became more than that. You know, at first, he just inspired me. You know, he just really inspired me because he was just so... His spirit was so strong and he was so happy and he just found joy in the smallest things. Amazing. And he just found joy. Every morning he was full of joy. And for me then, it was nearly... And I had that experience a few times with children. One was an autistic child I was working with. And she just kind of even... It was like she could sense I was in pain. Now, certain children, if they're autistic, they won't make eye contact at all. Or they just ignore you. But she would just give me little signals. Um, and I just couldn't believe it i was like what because i thought she was paying no attention to me and i could like i maybe i would have a lull and then she would like you know she tapped me on the hand or something if i was i remember that happened i was really i'll never forget it i was i was about to cry i was just so upset i just felt lost and she just kind of she had never in she'd never really acknowledged me before and we'd worked together for weeks and she just kind of tapped my hand and i'm I don't know what it was. Maybe it was an accident. I don't think so, but it's like they can, they could tell. Those yeah. kids could tell. Or maybe, maybe I'm just feeling that. I don't know, but it just felt like this, especially with Rain, the child, who with the song Neil Mamara is about. Then I just wrote this song about, I felt his spirit transcended his physical form. Yeah. You know? Wow. Oof. I felt like it really did. And then for me, it inspired my spirit to transcend my physical form because I was this wreck, emotional wreck, and my body's full of like, you know, the chemical, what's it called? Um, uh, that causes, you know, stress and just intensity. Um, but my body, I just felt like I, I was a wreck, you know, even from yeah. drinking and, um, you know, I feel, felt like I could transcend that. And then I just, I kind of intuited this song, Mil Mar Mara. I didn't even try and write it before I try and write a great song. But with this, I was like, whatever happens. And even the Irish came into it, you know, and it turned out to be, it's an amazing song, actually. The more I, I feel like, you know, when Ian McCulloch from, from Echo and the Bunnymen, he sometimes says, I didn't write that song. I channeled it. He's uh, like, you know, yeah. he's like, God wrote that song or whatever. Something right. else wrote that song. And I sometimes feel that about, I often feel that about Mil Mar Mar, something else wrote that song, um, because it was such an unusual style for me, even and lyrically. And I just imagine that we were like, just left our bodies and we were kind of like, for some reason, going into the depths, into the water and we're free. There was this freedom we had. There's, there's so much going on. It. That like, don't you think that with this like pandemic, people have been kind of forced to kind of like, 
reckon with that spiritual awakening that you had. Maybe they just don't know how to put it or they don't know that what's going on. Uh, but, but people have had to like go inside themselves and like channel like their mind and like something deeper. And, and those, and there's millions that are not, and those are the people that are suffering. Definitely. Um, I think, yeah, that seems to be being, it's being talked about a lot in the spiritual community. All right. Um, really? Yeah, it is actually now, that, you know, that you said it, um, I don't know if you know that man, but it's a great insight, but it's being talked about how much of an awakening it could stir in people you know, to search for something deeper or to transcend who they are. Because like I said to you, uh, I felt things were losing meaning. Yeah. Uh, Like I was observing myself feeling that way. I knew that things weren't losing meaning, but I was observing myself feeling that way, you know, Um, because it's all, it's, it's all the more, I think you're gaining new perspective because it matters so much then when you regain meaning. Like when someone says to me, like you say, your album is incredible. I feel that 10 times more after you've had this experience of maybe losing it. So it's, it's hard to explain, but if people get their identity taken away, like in a lockdown, it's tough, but yeah. it's so beneficial in the long run because you have to transcend your identity. You have to transcend your physical form even. And that will change your life forever. You know, it did for me. What and a fantastic story, Sean. Oh my God. Yeah, it definitely changed my life forever. It taught me how to be happy, even, you know what I mean? What, I, I mean, what's that saying? There's a saying here that most people have a highway to misery, but a dirt road to happiness, right? That's so, exactly, yeah. It's Man, like, that's a great saying. Yeah. Everyone just goes very easy to find the, the negative, like, oh, it's so hard or whatever, but yeah, like, the, so easy, the attitude yeah. is, is, is harder sometimes. It's just a habit, you know, it is. It's just something you you, you just fall into, you know, this like, yeah, the highway to negativity. Yeah, it's a really cool way to put it. I think Carl Jung said something similar as well about like um, the, 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 dar- the brighter the light, the darker the shadow and like the deeper the roots, the higher. Mm. Something about a tree, the deeper. Oh yeah, if the roots extend to hell for the leaves to reach heaven, something like that. For the branches to re- oh, reach heaven, the roots must beautiful. extend to hell. Oh yes. man, this is yeah. awesome. I, I mean, just talking to you, man. I gotta tell you. And yeah, we're talking inspired. great music, but like I'm inspired and my followers will be very inspired. This is awesome. Thank you so much awesome. for sharing Thanks. this That's stuff. Great to hear. Well, no, I'm really liking your insights too, man. It's actually bringing me back into this way of thinking, you know. Um, I love these conversations because you can always, I don't know, it's nearly, you can just find out something about yourself. Even last week you asked about Minbo Mara, but I was reading something last week and they said that, you know, in... Um, Moby Dick and Ahab, you know, the white whale um, right. they're trying to kill. It's like, that's not a whale at all. Um, oh, what was it? That's freedom or something. That's his oh, wow. self. Actually. Yeah, that's his true self. That's his real self. That's what he's actually trying to get. And I oh, just thought God. that was amazing. I was like, we're going to turn into the whitest whales of Zalyric and Mil Mormara. And I was like, why did I say that? I don't get a lot of it. And then I just read that about Moby Dick. It's like, he's actually chasing his true self, which is... Which is really, really cool, actually. Um, I think it was an article that Carl Jung, uh, or a lecture Carl Jung was involved in. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. just wanted to throw that in. But I, my point is, I'm still, with sounds like that, I'm still finding out what they mean to me. So it's like, I don't even own them. I just channel that everyone else owns it. You know? And like, sometimes you don't even need lyrics, and it just comes across what you're trying to get across. Like, really yeah, yeah. Stuff, like, like Saturn's Return. Oh and yeah, 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 yeah. Last track of your album, and it's yeah. it, it's beauty. It feels like yeah. spiritual nirvana, Sean. That's yeah, how it does, it, yeah. You know? it's yeah. it's just like how I would imagine, like you know, like having your chakras like glow all at the same time to be. Yeah, man. Jesus, yeah, definitely, yeah. So, That's um, a pretty cool way to say it, man. Yeah, it, you know definitely what it feels like, man. Tell us, tell us about this song. It, like, what a what a beautiful, unique song. Yeah, um, I don't I, like the, this, the concept Saturn, Saturn return. Do you know what that is? Or you know, uh, what that is? very, very shallowly. Um, yeah, you no can... worries. Uh, so basically, I work with a, uh, my best friend since I was eight, really. Uh, um, Owen Gein is his name. He's, he's my producer now, which is like interesting. But uh, we've just worked together for a long time, and we, you know, our styles have started to meld. So he actually pretty much wrote a lot of the synthesizers and he pretty much wrote a lot of Sat- that song Saturn's Return and I was making a melody for it and I was adding pieces but then in the end I said this is better without the lyrics and the melody 
and we both agreed. And uh, we kind of rearranged it, shortened it, changed some parts, but the song was just there. And, yeah. you know, just the feeling was there. And to me then, we weren't going to put it, I didn't put it on the album until last minute. I was going to put a different really? song on. Yeah, but then it just made, I listened to it. And there's this concept in spirituality where Saturn returns as your karma of youth. So like the, the planet Saturn, it's, it's astrological concept. So basically, and I felt like this happened to me. So when, you, when you're around 29, 30, people generally have this huge change in their life. And I've, I've observed it in lots of people and it happened to me too, where they just decide I'm changing everything or, you know, maybe they think about it, maybe they don't, but you have this opportunity to completely change. And there's these paintings by Goya, I think, um, a Spanish artist, Spanish artist Goya, I think, and uh, yep, Ruben, yep. Ruben, yeah, they have the paintings of Saturn eating children and everyone's like, oh, that's so dark, but it really it's eating your childhood. So it comes back and it, everything's up for review it's your karma of youth and you can choose to pay off this karma, right? You know, at that time, or you can choose not to. And when you're 60, it's going to come back around again. So um, I felt like I was told by an astrologer after, you know, a reading, they're like, well, you've completed your Saturn's return. Um, I looked into what it was and I was like, oh my God, I'm not very, I'm not too easily convinced. I know I'm spiritual, but it took a huge spiritual awakening for me to be convinced by you know, Hinduism and chakras or Kundalini, I wouldn't have bought any of that, man. No way, unless I had the actual, I felt it, you know. So um, I, I read up on Saturn's return. I was like, holy shit, this happened to me. This, this actually happened to me where my life got turned upside down. I paid off my, I, I even wrote poems and lyrics about like paying my debts, you know, for, this is like, I feel like I'm paying off some debts or I'm, mm -hmm. my debts have been paid or something like that. And uh, it just, it felt right to me. It just, it connected with me. So then the album became, after that, talking to that astrologer, the album became Karma of Youth and Saturn's Return, I knew was perfect to finish it off. And it all happened so quickly. And I'm just so happy that you said it feels like, you know, your chakras are aligned. That's that's actually an amazing feeling, you know, uh, that you've just said that because I started to write lyrics again for that song, and uh, one of the lyrics are in it, like you know, are have aligned. The chorus part is about uh, you know, just, I don't know if I'm using chakras or stars aligning, but uh, just that that you've said that now, it's it's really I'm getting and, like, and, I, and, and I meant it like even like the like from the beginning, like it starts at the bottom and it's like you almost feel the energy going up. It really mm, yeah, definitely. very intense. I love that. Yeah, I love that part, especially where there's a huge bass kick. I think it's like, it's a three minutes in. It kind of goes to a kind of melancholic drop, a kind of C-section or a melan melancholic, melancholic kind of bridge. And right. then it just kicks right back in. Uh, and I just love there's a huge charge behind it. And like you said, it just raises your energy up. I just thought it was the perfect way to end that journey. Epic. You know, it really ends the, the journey of the album well, you know. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad you like that. I really feel like that's just an inspiring song, and I hope that I hope something happens for that song, like soundtrack wise or something. You know, I think it would yeah, be great yeah. to end a movie or even like um, something like that. You know, speaking of soundtracks and movies, Sean, um, mm. your songs have been featured on a couple of really important mediums, right? Like the FIFA video game, the FIFA soccer video yeah. game, mm. um, uh, and also in a popular Netflix show, Shadow Hunters. Yeah, Shadow Hunters. Yeah. Um, so, so just curious, what it feels like for for those of us that are, haven't been in that position to, you know, to have your art, your baby, you know, you know, with the likes of Messi, with a virtual Messi, or or, or with yeah. uh, people on Netflix. Yeah, it's amazing because people, you know, you 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 gain fans from places that you know you may not have ever expected, um, like FIFA then. The song got a match of the day, which is like a huge program on BBC as well. And it's like all over, you know, it's just popping up on channels all over Europe and, you know, being used in the most random places. It's always on like TV in Ireland and stuff like that. But um, it, it, well, the really special part for me is it came, it, it opens people up to the song, but then if you see the comments on YouTube or the amount of people who get in touch with me and send me a private message going, look, my life has been going really difficult and I heard this song or they'll tell me their stories. And some of the stories I've been told like were heartbreaking for me. And I was just so happy. Like the guys would get in touch with me going, my engagement just broke up. <laughs> you know, I don't, I'm like, Oh my God, 
you know, and they'd want to talk to me and say, this song has just like hit me so hard. And that's the effect because, you know, it gets your music out there, but then there's like this alchemy, you know, there's, it's the song, people get access to it, but then it hits them for what phase of their life they're in. And Milmore Mara really just does that. You know, there's, there's songs you hear and it's like, okay, this song makes me want to go out. This song makes me want to dance. For some reason, Milmore Mara just really hit people who were going through a difficult time. There's something in that song and it kind of inspired them. Yeah. Um, there, there's a guy in France got in touch and he was just telling me, he broke up with his childhood sweetheart, etc., and had like rashes all over his body. Then there was that message you talked about where there's this guy in a motorway and it's totally clear in the middle of the lockdown and he was like, yeah. I feel alive again. That kind of, you know, to hear that is just, it's epic. It really is. Um, yeah. I think, that, I, I think the core feeling is that like you, ha you can like break through through, through anything. If I, yeah, had, if I had to describe is. it with a gun to my head, like, man, I have no limits, you know, like I yeah. am the leader of my own life, like yeah. screw the world, screw all this negativity. Bro. Yeah. Yeah. You're just transcending this, you know, that kind of conditioning, that social conditioning where you're supposed to think this way or feel this way or act this way. And you're like, you know, fuck all that. I can transcend <laughs> all that. I can feel however way I want. Now, you know, but I can feel something bigger than all this. Not whatever way I want. It's, you know, what you want is, if I wanted to have that experience, it probably wouldn't have happened. You can't even force these, like, True. you know, True. these profound experiences in life. They just happen to you. And um, it's, that's it. I tried to capture that and I'm really glad I, well, I channeled it. I feel, I feel a hundred percent feel I channeled it and captured it. Maybe I feel, you know, and then it's just, if I didn't, I didn't expect that, you know, the effect it would have on people getting on the, the soundtracks. It's, it's gone on. The ads has gone on. It is amazing. I'm so thankful for all of that. Um, I'm really excited as well because I just, I just got word today that uh, my music is moving to a new publishing company, uh, which I'm really excited about. So um, yeah, yeah, I love that. I think it's a great avenue for my music as well because it's got a lot of emotional charge to be on soundtracks. You yeah. know, to be, you know, because even with FIFA, the, you play with your friends, you share these memories and emotions, you know, um, it's a great medium for your music. It really is. Um, so, yeah, it's that's just why, I, that's why I know, I know for a fact that your music is going to reach millions and millions and millions of people because it's, it, it's a spirit, it's a, it's a human experience. You know, you're not singing about, you know, going to the club and getting some booty. You're, going, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. talking about some things that like touch our most inner selves, man. So yeah. there's, there's only one way for that, man. I think it has a purpose. I think it has a purpose. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, that, um, I think you're right. And that's, that's been the feeling for me. And it's hard sometimes, you know, uh, because like, I don't, it's like, I feel that that's my purpose. And I wonder sometimes my, my purpose is for my music to reach as many people as possible but sometimes you wonder is as an artist you're like should I be more experimental should that am I should this be the right direction that I'm making like anthemic you know music should I try and be a bit more experimental but I, I always feel that that's the right path yeah even you know if you have a spiritual message it has to connect with people in a way that, you know, stimul stimulation is key for me. I think you two are that band as well. That's what I admire about you two. They've got this momentum in their music. It stimulates you. And it, it doesn't just stimulate you and you want to hit the club. It stimulates your soul. It does, yeah. There's something, something about the edge. Or there are the alchemy of the edge and the bass and drums. Mm -hmm. With Bono's melodies, it's just something I find spiritual about their music. And, you know, some people, you know, I know people that can be critical of you too, but there are certain songs I find by you two are pretty much perfect. Yeah, they're not, they're not a perfect band, but, but when, when, it, when you're in a live setting with 60,000 people and something happened in the world and, and, and they'll play a song like Bad or something, it transcends, you know. It definitely does. It can just like it bring just you to tears, move you, it moves you. And that's a quality that I've, I've, I've tried to incorporate in my music too. That's something I really admire. There's those bands that have that kind of soaring sensation, you know, that's, that's what YouTube, YouTube captured, especially like you, where the streets of no name, I think is a perfect song. I, mm -hmm. 
there's not that many. But it's like that song transcends the band and themselves. Yeah, it does. And I, I know Brian Eno is in there as well, but there's just something about that song that's bigger yeah. than, I don't know, for me personally, it's just, oh, yeah. you know, it's bigger than life. Something Absolutely. about it. I can't Absolutely. explain it, can't put it into words. I suppose oh, the best art you can't, you can't really, you can't really explain why. Epic. Sean, you've been so generous with your time. I want to ask you a couple more questions, man, and then yeah, I'll let you get on. But, but like, this has been so enjoyable, man. I lost track of time. Uh, I, want to, I want to ask about your music videos for a second. Um, they are fascinating, and I'm sure you did this on purpose. There seems to be, like, a, like a common thread to them of, you know, some esoteric messages. Yeah. Um, or, or am I nuts? Yeah, there is. No, you're not nuts at all. There is esoteric messages. Um, uh, that wasn't me. That was uh, a, my, a friend of mine who directed the video. And he, he, it's very interesting you asked about this. Neil Mar in particular, he put a lot of esoteric references. And he referenced actually, uh, uh, he has his chimney in it. He's referencing Kundalini. He's referencing all these Hindu uh, things and culture, cultural kind of ideas. And at that time, I didn't know that much about it. So he kind of like, and then I had uh, this spiritual awakening a couple of years, uh, about a year later, but he had preceded all that. And he, I just let him do whatever he wanted. I was like, yeah, okay. And uh, it was so interesting then that I became, it was, it's one of those things in life, those kind of synchronicities, those profound events. So he planned it where the video for Young Gods connected to Great, video great. from Neil Romara, and there's another video now he wants to connect. Um, he has in detail every idea really connected esoterically. I probably can't, there's times when I, he has explained it to me a lot, but there's times when I forget. All the <laughs> it's like but a game. Yeah, so basically the girl in it goes to, He's told me this so many times where she goes to the ocean and what it represents. And I can't think of it now because it means, you know, the song means something different for me, but it meant something different for him where that all the people, sorry, I'll have to ask him again, but there's a yeah. huge, there's huge meaning in the people leaving the water. You know, the, at, there's this crowd of people. She's walking against the crowd into the water at the end. And that's not her. People think that she's committing suicide, but that's her, I think. I, I know there's a lyric in the song where we're going to leave our bodies with the surf. So you're transcending the physical self. It's in the water, I, Sean. You know, I, I, I know that's like a, like, it sounds like a ridiculous question. It's just the power of water, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, and look, I, I don't know. I'm going to share this with you, basically sharing it with, 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 uh, with all my followers. But, you know, I recently got a divorce, right? And I, oh, I like, I, after it, no, it's all good, man. But um, my spiritual journey. But I went into the ocean, uh, yeah, like, like yeah. after. Yeah. And it was like, yeah. uh, it, I felt like my soul, like just like squeezed, like it was like, a, it, it, like the power of the salt water. And it, you Man, know, yeah. so much stuff that you talk about, uh, you know, um, about water, you know, in, um, in, in, in young gods, uh, you know, the rivers yeah. and so, so, the water, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know why I felt compelled to share that with you, man. But like, yeah, water. No, no, it's good. I actually got some tingles there. So I got a little energetic movement there when you said that. So I did. Yeah. That's always a telltale sign for me. I don't know why you said that, but thanks for sharing it. But um, I just got a little energetic kind of uh, peak there. It was intense. Yeah, that's something you said it to me. Uh, I shared a picture with a friend and she said, why are you so obsessed with water? And I was like, I didn't realize I'm so obsessed. She was like, your photographs are always by the water or you're in the water or your videos, you're running to the water or someone's going to the water. Everything is water with you. And when I actually moved to that city, that's an anchor I moved beside the water and uh, someone said to me, actually a shaman said, you went there to heal. That's where you heal. You heal in the water. Now I swim every day. I li like I have to live beside the ocean in Ireland. So I get in every day now and nice. it's incredible for you. It's like there's so much, it does so much good for you. It's just, it's off the charts and it's like energetically, it's just healing you. So yeah. If you're probably, you're on an emotional level, you need that now. And that's really going to serve you, really. And if it, it's colder, the better for some reason. Maybe the nervous system. But uh, now, right now, I have two cold showers a day. And I swim in the sea ocean as well. Um, just like cold water, I find so therapeutic. And um, it brings you into the moment. It does. And it heals you beyond levels I can express. You probably, a shaman would probably tell you that, 
the, you know, the levels, I know it's good, for, it's supposed to be very good for the dream world as well, and uh, how you're, you're sleeping washes away negativity from your energetic self and all this. Epic. You can get very deep into this stuff, but yeah, at man. the end of the day, if you feel like going to it, there's a reason. And if, like, I suppose I spend so much time with it, there's a reason. It does heal you. But like, yeah. Uh, other people would say I'm, I'm cancer. I'm a water sign, so I'm drawn to it. What's your sign? What's your star sign? Gemini. Gemini. Okay, okay right. Yeah. Well, I don't know, but uh, water is just healing. Sure. Yeah, you're not, you're close enough to me, so um, Gemini is like, your birthday was like last month. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last month, man. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, dude, yeah, so, so, so let me finish with this. I'd like to finish with, the, with this question. You, you have great taste in music, obviously. You're a fantastic artist. And ever since young, you've been, you know, Joy Division, the whole thing. Mm. So what are, what are you listening to, Sean? Why don't you recommend us some of your current favorites, some, maybe something obscure or not obscure? What's moving you right now? Brian Eno, a lot. Uh, I listen to Eno a lot. Um, in particular, uh, I, I kind of just listen to random songs uh let me see if i can give you an album of something i'd really recommend i've been listening to a lot of like nin kind of like um me ninjutsu meditation music so it's just, it's just strange the phases i go through right now it's a lot of ambient music but uh Very you nice. kind of have me on the, you kind of have me on the spot i was really excited by that band twin peaks um mm -hmm. i can't think of the name of their album right now but um I'll look it up but they're a band i would recommend just for this like dirty guitar sound um they they have like this it's kind of i felt like they were a mixture between the replacements and the rolling stones so yeah. i like them i don't know if you've listened to them but um i thought they were they were fun but i haven't heard much coming from them since um i recommended i listened to my friend what did I, I listen to the water boys a lot as well yeah interesting yeah, I actually do. A Pagan Place. Um, a lot of his earlier stuff is incredibly spiritual. I was listening to Hall of the Moon like before this interview, actually. No way. Yeah. No way. Good yeah. Good <laughs> if you actually listen to his earlier stuff or your audience want to listen to Waterby's earlier stuff, there's a song called The Pan Within. And he has got a lot. It's, it's, the album, I think, is A Pagan Place, or there's a song on it called The Pagan Place. But he's got a lot of like spiritual pagan references that you don't hear him talk about. He doesn't mention, but they're all there. So the pan within, pan is this guy when you, apparently if you have an out of body experience or you astral project, pan is the God that leads you to the underworld. And lots of people have seen pan. So like it's, uh, he's, the, he's the God in pan's lab or with the like, the looks like kind of a goat. Yeah, so he's got this song called the pan within and all the lyrics, if you read it, are referencing like, you know, out of body experience. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I love I love discovering that that how esoteric um, the Water Boys actually were. They actually are quite esoteric as well. They were. Um, yeah, so um, they've got all this mad spiritual imagery uh, in it too. Yeah. Um, and for now, yeah, I, I I suppose I'm just writing so much of my own music that yeah. I'll dip in and out of other bands. But that's my that's um that's what I'm missing at the moment. Some of the old school water boy stuff, Brian Eno. There you go. That's that's a great selection right there. Yeah, thanks, man. Ah, Sean, yeah. man, this has been so fun. I think I think this is a good place to leave it, man. You've been. This yeah. has been so so enjoyable, dude. Just want to thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. I've loved this as well, man. It's really kind of absolutely. Brilliant. I just love these conversations. Thank you for like your knowledge and sharing. Ah, with man, me. absolutely, dude. And I, and I am telling you something. We're going to meet when you either headline three arena or Croke Park because I will, I will go and we'll celebrate, man. I'm manifesting it. It's going to happen, dude. That's a date, man. Yeah, that's a date. I love Absolutely, it. I love man. it. Yeah, let's manifest it. Let's do it. Absolutely, Sean. All right, man. You stay safe, man. Continue rocking yeah, out. You too. You too, man. All right, man. See you, dude.